ಹಾಗು ಜೀ ಹಾವು ಜೀ ಹಾವು ಗುಡ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ಮಾಜ ಹೌಸ್ ಅಮೃತ್ಸರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇನ್ನೋವೇಟಿವ್ ಲಿಟ್ರರಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಕಲ್ಚರಲ್ ಸ್ಪೇಸ್ ಹೌಸ್ಡ್ ಇನ್ ಆರ್ ಹೋಮ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಆರ್ ಗೆಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಆರ್ ಆಥರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅವಾರ್ಡ್ ವಿನಿಂಗ್ ಜರ್ನಲಿಸ್ಟ್ ಪಲ್ಲವಿ ಅಯ್ಯರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ಕಾನ್ವರ್ಸೇಷನ್ ವಿತ್ ಹರ್ ಇಸ್ ವಿವೇಕ್ ಮೆನೇಜಸ್ ಕ್ರಿಯೇಟರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಕೋ ಫೌಂಡರ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ವಂಡರ್ಫುಲ್ ಗೋವಾ ಲಿಟ್ರೇಚರ್ ಫೆಸ್ಟಿವಲ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅ ವೈಡ್ಲಿ ಪಬ್ಲಿಷ್ ಫೋಟೋಗ್ರಾಫರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ರೈಟರ್ Pallavi has spent two decades reporting from across India, China, Europe, Indonesia and Japan and she is now in Madrid. Her latest book which we will talk about this evening is Orienting an Indian in Japan. I'm going to show you the book. It's beautiful beautiful cover, the lovely uh, colors and the illustration. It's really lovely and as lovely as what lies inside. I'm going to hand over to Vivek now. to carry this conversation forward and thank you both for being here today thank you so much uh, preeti and uh, thank you for inviting me i'm a big uh, fan of the work that you do and also of this lovely space that you've created and uh, so uh, i'm quite honored to be asked and a great pleasure to be speaking to palavi uh, palavi uh, i'm a big fan of your writing as with my, like many others i have read and previously enjoyed many of your books i happen to have a couple here this lovely book on china um this absolutely quite invaluable book really i would call it on europe of uh, punjabi parmesan i know you have other books and uh, i really want to congratulate you uh, as priti was saying this is really a delightful book um orienting an indian in japan um i thoroughly enjoyed reading it i also um I learned a lot and i also must say that you know i can see the development of you know, your own writing and it uh, you know uh, you've become so much more assured and in this book it's really it's really a pleasure to go on the journey with you so congratulations uh, on the book thank you thank you so much for those kind words baby um before we begin our conversation it's always lovely to uh, hear the author, some of the words in the author's own voice so would you please read something for us maybe you can tell me what page it is and uh, i can kind of take a yeah. look no so i'd be really happy to although i wasn't expecting to and as a result i don't have my reading glasses with me so i'm going to have to hold the book at um uh quite a distance in order to be able to do this but we should be fine i'm going to read uh from the prologue itself and um sort of the penultimate page or just before the penultimate page uh when i talk about how i discover that um i'm going to be moving to japan uh which was not something i was aware of until the summer of 2016 and the reason behind it was the diplomatic posting of my husband so we'd been in indonesia at this point for four years and then i was just told by by julio my husband that we'd be moving to tokyo So when I learned in early 2016 that Julio's new posting would be taking us to Tokyo that summer I confronted the fact that I'd been missing a critical piece of the Asian jigsaw puzzle for there was very little of use that I knew about Japan I was familiar with the troughs and crests of the political topography of the region from its democracies to its autocracies but what all the disparate Asian countries that I had known thus far had in common was an upward thrust of people and commerce. Delhi, Beijing and Jakarta were all noisy, chaotic, dynamic megalopolises heaving with their own contradictory promises. Their trajectories were rising. Their stories suggested the promise of spring, albeit a polluted one, rather than the melancholy of autumn. but japan was an anomaly its geographic location on the eastern edge of the map served as a metaphor for its seeming separateness from the rest of asia it was rich and quiet old and punctual a former colonizer rather than colony rule obsessed rather than loophole hungry 
I only had a very imprecise sense of the Japanese rampaging across the continent with bayonets and walkmans. There were the snatches of pop songs that Japan conjured up. There was Big in Japan by Alphaville and also Simon and Garfunkel's Kodachrome. I have a Nikon camera. I want to take a photograph and so on. Someone once told me that it was possible to buy the used underwear of young women from vending machines in Tokyo. I had read a lot of Haruki Murakami, but that had hardly helped to clarify much. And this was pretty much the entirety of my Japan-oriented cultural capital when Julio had announced that we'd be moving to Tokyo in the summer of 2016. So I'd reached out to the hive mind on social media for recommendations on reading, and I was inundated with replies like, oh, Tanazaki, of course, and Soseki, but uh, Kokoro first. So I compiled a list of books and I bought several of them, but dealing with the administrative minutiae of winding down life in Jakarta didn't leave me with much time to actually read them. I did, however, begin to take Japanese lessons because I'd learned to speak Chinese quite well and passable Indonesian too. So how hard could Japanese be, I thought. The answer, it was quickly evident, was very. There seemed to be an inordinate number of long words that I had to learn that didn't have any specific meaning beyond signifying politeness. So in Chinese, for example, thanks, thank you, was xie xie, end of the matter. In Japanese, there was arigato, which is informal, arigato gozaimasu, proper form, domo arigato gozaimasu, seriously thankful, and domo sumimasen arigato gozaimasu. This is weak in the knees with gratitude, thankful. But then I came across yoroshiko onegaishimasu. So what does that mean? I asked my teacher. It means, she said, thank you. Basically, it was possible to learn Japanese for a month and only end up being able to say thank you. So I ranted about the fussiness of Japanese grammar over lunch with Koyama-san, the Jakarta-based Japanese mother of a friend of my older son. Oh, I'm not sure how I'm ever going to manage to learn all those conjugations, I groaned. Koyama-san looked at me unblinkingly and she replied, I think, Pallavi-san, for you, the bigger problem is going to be how to learn to speak softly. I was going to have plenty of opportunities to learn the painful truth of her words in the coming years. So I'll leave it over there. Lovely. Thank you so much for that. Um, as uh, the audience will realize, this book is very funny also and dry. And uh, what's lovely about it is Pallavi really lays herself out there. And, uh, um, so you follow it with, with a great deal of interest, but also it's very, uh, it's very engaging. In a way, actually, and I mean this entirely as a big compliment, it's like Bill Bryson. Uh, you're like a version of Bill Bryson traveling around. I really, I really like that. I'll well take done. that. So one of, that. one of the... <laughs> great. Um, his, uh, yeah, Bryce Bryson used to be great. Um, I, I, uh, one of, what's interesting is I actually had this pegged out already to ask you a question about, but I was interested that you skipped over one paragraph in this prologue in which you use the word, which is, you know, it's an old fashioned word, it's not often deployed anymore. You use the word inscrutable um, to describe uh, Japan as opposed to what China was like to you before. And later again and again, I mean, you are a highly traveled cosmopolitan person and, you know, cities and countries around the world tend to be becoming more like each other than, than less. But you use phrases, I see on page 13, you use the word that a lot of what happened in Japan felt stranger than fiction these are quite uh, these are it's uh, which meant you know you're encountering something quite quite unlike what you had seen before can you explain a little bit about this what what was stranger than fiction for someone as as well traveled as yourself uh, yeah, encounter what uh, in in encountering japan Japan was very special. Um, and it's true. I think when we look at sort of orientalizing works on Asia, the word inscrutable does pop up a lot. And often it is in um, connection to the, the East, the Orient, China being the largest part of, of that part of the world. And when I did go to China, I didn't find it inscrutable at all. Um, I found people remarkably open. I thought that they had an excellent sense of humor. They spoke loudly. They spoke often. They were quite political. 
people. Um, I love the food and I didn't really have that much trouble connecting to it at all. Uh, I have to say a lot of those things that I was expecting in China, this kind of the, the inability to read the situation, the inability to know what people were thinking, the long sort of awkward social pauses, all of that I experienced far more in Japan than in China. And I think the bit that I had left out was about the food saying something. So it was kind of tongue in cheek. It was basically saying that, um, you know, Japanese breakfast, which is like cold raw fish is, uh, is completely unintelligible in some ways um, to an Indian palate. Unlike at least Chinese food, which has some resonance um, for the Indian palate. But um, there's so much about Japan that is quite uh, distinct, that is quite unique. I think some of it also has to do with the fact that the Japanese themselves have internalized uh, some of the romanticism and orientalizing that they have been subject to and in many ways have almost kind of come to believe it and so that it becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy um, and you see that a lot in a version of writing a genre of writing in Japan called Nihon Jinron which is completely devoted to trying to explain why Japan is so different and so unique and, um, and somehow separate from the rest of the world. And we can get to Nihon Jinron later, but they have absurd kind of reasoning, including that the Japanese brain is somehow built differently and is more right sized than left sized. And so it hears the chirping of crickets in a different way, in a more emotional way than people who have non-Japanese brains. And I mean, there's a bunch of stuff around that. But for me, I suppose, especially coming from other big chaotic Asian cities, like I mentioned, having grown up in Delhi myself, having spent four years in Jakarta just before moving to Japan and seven years in China a decade before that um, there was um, so much about Tokyo that did feel uh, uh, Peter Natural, for example, the safety, the idea that you could have a city of 30 million people where you have six year olds and seven year olds that essentially take public transport on their own to go to school and come back every day. Um, you know, having come from a city like Delhi, where the people have uh, are accompanying their teenagers to go to the park because there's all this hoo ha about how safe or unsafe it is. And grown up women have to have people, um, you know, that on WhatsApp away every time that they sit in a cab to kind of monitor their journeys and so on. So to have that level of public trust um, that was almost bucolic and kind of village-like uh, uh, from uh, the perspective of an Indian was preternatural. To have the kind of punctuality where you had guests that were expected at 7 or my Japanese teacher who was expected at 5 p.m. And the moment the clock strikes 5 or strikes 7, the bell rings in this synchronized manner was natural. Um, the fact that almost nothing I ever lost stayed lost, but was always found. I call Japan the country where what is lost is never found was Peter Natural. And this ranged from losing money, credit cards, tiffin boxes, um, laptop, bicycle, you name it. Um, it was recovered and it was usually recovered by the police, uh, which was efficient at doing this, which is also something that is Peter Natural. I mean, there was something really quite exceptional about this country and very different to any other part of the world. Um, uh, uh, in many ways, it was, like I said, it was on the kind of edge of the map and it was sort of liminal as a space. It was partly uh, westernized, partly Asian, partly hypermodern, partly very traditional. Um, so, you know, it was in the intercies of all these different things that were going on in Japan that you found quite an interesting, unique, different culture, which um, made it less uh, which made it slightly more opaque and less accessible immediately to um, trying to sort of get to grips with it um, than other countries that I have traveled in. And I think that's partly also because the Japanese themselves are prone to not to, not that much prone to self-analysis and certainly not that much prone to kind of put their view across uh, uh, as easily as in many other cultures. So when you are trying to speak to Japanese to try to understand how they are thinking about things, they can be quite reticent or or, or or, or, or economical with their answers, uh, which can also therefore make it um, harder, I think, as an outsider or as a foreigner to kind of come to grips with immediately. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, and there, uh, there's so much there that, that, uh, that I'd like to ask you about. It is true that there isn't, a, unlike many other countries, there isn't much of a literature 
written by Japanese trying to explain Japan to foreigners, right? I mean, many other countries does, do have that genre kind of there, but in Japan, uh, the, it seems to some extent they basically throw their hands up in the air and say, you know, you won't get it, you won't understand it. Um, but there are a couple of things which I'd like to ask you, which which come along with what, what you just said. Uh, one of them, which is related to, I, I did get it in some of what you just described, but Gurcharan Das says in, your, in his uh, very nice blurb for your book that there's a delightful surprise in every chapter, but he says that uh, that it's, uh, you know, the delightful surprise, he says, especially in its moral complexity. And he also uses the word inscrutable, but he says... <laughs> Unavoidable, yeah. yeah. Probably an old-fashioned word uh, in his, in his, in the way he, he's not hedged it as well as you have. But, but what, what about this moral complexity? So like, I mean, are humans humans? Or, or, or the Japanese have, uh, have something going on that's a little bit different? Is it a community? Is it a kind of community mor morality? Is it an individual morality? Um, could, could you explain a little that's bit? That's a huge question. And it's hard for me as an outsider to kind of take a definitive uh, stance on what Japanese morality is. I do think that there is a, um, a stronger sense of communi um, community um, and sort of obligation to others, the idea that we exist in a network of obligations. And that is something that's very obvious and it's reiterated uh, through the educational system and through um, you know education at home to the family as well. And I think to a much um, stronger uh, uh, effect um, than in other Confucian countries like China or Vietnam. So this idea of communitarianism or, uh, versus individuality is quite common when we are talking about the West, the sort of individual West versus this kind of Confucian oriented community or values, uh, valorizing orient. Um, but again, I, I, I found China, for example, to be somewhere where individual Individualism was inescapable, and I think all the sort of get rich, the, the, the sort of energy, the animal spirits that Deng Xiaoping's reforms um, let loose, uh, it was very clear in, in that, the kind of in, the strong sense of individualism that you actually do have um, in China. Japan, on the other hand, I think, again, is closer to this uh, conventional idea that we have of um, uh, communal Confucianist societies. And uh, you see it, you know, I visited uh, several schools because I was very interested in early education because so much of this is a culture, acculturation from a very early age. How does this happen? How, why is it that in, an Indian, for example, will think nothing about, you know, eating an ice cream and throwing the stick on the road, whereas to a Japanese person, they would become apoplectic, you know, if they saw something like that. What is it about the Japanese that makes them so clean? What is it about the Japanese that creates this kind of civic consciousness, this idea that they will return money if they find it on the road rather than pocket it. Is it really their brains? Are they more left-sided, right-sided like the, like the uh, Nihon Jinron people say? Mm, I didn't think so. So there's something else going on over here. And to me, it felt that obviously the schools are uh, uh, an interesting location to look at what's going on. So I visited several schools and um, and I think uh, I was blown away, for example, by how uh, much emphasis there is placed on understanding the feelings of other people and on in many ways, uh, putting and prioritizing the feelings of your classmates over and above yourself. Everything, including in the Japanese language is about other people. When somebody leaves from office in the evening, for example, they don't say bye to their colleagues. They apologize for going first. It's like, I am leaving. I am so sorry for leaving before you. That is the standard way of saying ciao. You know, in a, most other countries, it's like, see ya. Yeah. And here you're saying, I'm so very sorry for leaving before you and inconveniencing you. So it's kind of built into the texture of the language itself. And everybody I spoke to about the cleanliness. So the ch Japanese children have to clean their own schools. They do not hire janitors. They might hire janitors for particularly difficult um, uh, to clean places like water coolers and sometimes toilets, but at least the common areas and classrooms are always cleaned by students themselves from, um, uh, the, from primary school onwards. So when I would speak to them about littering, they would say, but how can we litter? Because that would be terrible for everybody else. I mean, the idea was always everybody else. It was this kind of normalizing of civic behavior that uh, was very interesting um, and, and you know, quite unique. So again, 
and I'm not sure that that makes them inscrutable. It certainly makes them um, uh, admirable in many ways. Um, there is a downside to this because if in your morality or if in your worldview or value system, you are always valorizing other people, there is the tendency therefore to put your own needs, your own desires sort of below or second, which can in itself lead to mental dysfunction of which we have plenty in Japan. We have suicides of which we have plenty in Japan. Uh, we have a culture of uh, silly overwork of which we have plenty in Japan simply because people don't want to leave the office before anybody else does um, and so on. So, you know, it can have its downsides as well and perhaps therefore the complex morality that you talked about earlier. Uh, but um, more than any other culture that I have had the privilege to see up close and sort of live in, I would say it is more communal and more other other um, oriented. Oh, interesting. Um, I remember when, uh, covering something like this in my high school uh, anthropology classes, and there was a kind of quick answer which was given to us, which is that homogeneity, right? Japan is an extraordinarily homogenous country um, uh, with, with very, I mean, as opposed to definitely India, but even China has got so many minorities that it has to deal with, whereas J Japan really doesn't. Um, and and which which so in a way the uh, the Western point of view was that maybe I don't subscribe to it, but that this is a form of tribalism, right? It's a community values, which is a kind of a tribal view. And uh, you have a very interesting sentence in your in your book on page twenty four. It says when you were still coming to terms with Japan, uh, where you said I knew right off the bat that I'd landed somewhere special. Nowhere else I knew blended the comfort of the first world with the anthropologically beguiling complexity of less Western, Westernized societies. Japan was not Europe and not quite Asia. That's that's super interesting. I mean that put that's a that is a highly intriguing uh, kind of a judgment, which which of course you explain. But can you explain a little bit more about that? Uh, this this is a country, as we know. I mean, unlike India, like China, it never was colo colonized. Uh, maybe that's one of the historical reasons for it. But it did no, the colonizing. <laughs> it did the colonizing. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know this complex morality. I was thinking about it from the point of view of some of my Korean friends. You know who don't think of uh, uh, Japan, you know, particularly moral uh, guide or beacon. But but anyway, I would like I'd like to ask you to explain a little bit about this. Like that sounds like it's a. Uh, it, may, it really does underline Japan's uniqueness because it's, it's maintained this ancient kind of a undisrupted culture to some extent, but, but it's westernized so dramatically, right, in terms of other aspects of its economy, of its industry. Can you explain a little bit about that? Uh -oh. Absolutely. So at a superficial level first, uh, which is the level of, say, the visitor, the tourist, or, you know, me when I first arrived over there. Um, I think it's like just in terms of what strikes you is that you have the comfort of the first world, right? So you have uh, your Dean and DeLuca coffee shops, you have all the recognizable um, commercial brand names from around the world, you have uh, excellent public transport, you have good health care, you know, things run on time, things are neat and clean. So in many, and you know, things are nicely maintained. So you don't have the kind of, you know, open sewers of Jakarta or uh, people spitting on the road, uh, like in the Beijing Hutongs or, or whatever. You have this kind of first world uh, prettiness uh, and ease of life uh, that kind of makes it easy uh, for you as a visitor or a traveler. But at the same time, you know, many of these other countries, like you have read Punjabi Parmesan. I lived in uh, Brussels for four years. I mean, ultimately, they become kind of uh, very predictable and quite, uh, I mean, a lot of their uh, folklore, a lot of their traditions, they have been secularized and the society has been emptied in some ways of its anthropology, you know, through the process of modernization. And Japan has resolutely hung on a lot to its past. It has a complex relationship with this past because a lot of that past is indebted to China and to South Korea, and it's not very comfortable with always acknowledging that. So 
it's not as though that relationship with its past is not complicated, it is. However, in many ways, it has been able to maintain that thread and link with its past better than some of these other countries because it was not colonized and because it did not have these kind of revolutionary upheavals that, for example, we've seen in China, where because of the cultural revolution, um, you know, you saw a kind of disjuncture and a disruption from its past to its modern, its modern present. Um, so in some ways, you know, a lot of what you would imagine um, traditional or ancient China to be in terms of, you know, those misty temples atop a winding mountain that looks like it's out of an in, uh, ink um, scape uh, from some uh, painter, you will find those um, vistas and you will find also the spirit that animates those vistas more likely in Japan than you would in China. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, I think Japan is really quite interesting because of that. The fact that it was able to avoid, unlike many of the other Asian nations that surround it, some of these huge um, uh, epochal upheavals um, right, right, uh, right. culturally. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolutely fascinating space. But if I may, you also said something earlier about how when you were doing your uh, class in university, I think a lot of the, the one of the explanations that it was based on was the idea of the homogeneity of oh, yes. Japan and that it's a very homogeneous uh, country and culture compared to say India or China, and that is true, it's smaller also. However, I do think that they are kind of disingenuous about their homogeneity often as well. And uh, there is less homogeneity than the Japanese might like us to believe because the idea of Japanese homogeneity has a sort of political element to it, uh, which is to kind of keep out um, others because we are so coherent as a culture that the moment we allow immigration and become polluted by others, we will fundamentally change. But in fact, uh, Japanese J Japan has also had its own tradition of immigration. Historically, it is not as though the Japanese people sprang fully formed from the sun goddess, as many Japanese seem to believe they did. But they came across land bridges. Um, they came from China. They came from Korea. Uh, Japan till today has many different ethnicities. It has the Ainu, for example, in the north in Hokkaido, which until 2006 were not granted any kind of recognition as a sort of separate ethnicity. Um, they have the, the Buraku, the Buraku, Burakumen, which are basically like an untouchable caste, very similar to um, India's Dalits um, that existed for hundreds of years and continue to face deep discrimination. And of course, they have the Zainichi, who are ethnic Koreans who've been here sometimes six, seven, eight generations. They have ethnic Chinese. And so there are more multicultural than I think many Japanese themselves realize. And there is also more inequality economically than many Japanese like to admit. So the idea is that we're this kind of middle class, rich, very homogenous society, this is us, and we need to protect this. And there isn't that much public discussion about the actual fissures and fault lines that do lie in Japanese society and make it much less therefore homogenous um, than uh, both we as outsiders and even most Japanese people think of themselves as. Super interesting again. Um, I'd like to pause for a second and say, please, if there are questions from the audience, um, please put them in the chat window. And I'd like to go through a couple of things here. Um, a comment, Bijoya Savian says, uh, Pallavi, you are very interesting and erudite and lively writer, fun to watch and listen. So you're doing well so far. Um, keep it up. Um, and Sangamitra Malik says, I cannot think of Indians thinking of others' comforts to such an extent, for sure. No. Um, and uh, Gurup Desh Singh says, 50 years ago, we did used to think of the others, but crass materialism of recent years has completely dumped this idea. That may be. Um, I would like to, but Farah has a question. Uh, does Buddhism have something to do with this also? So the kind of behavior that you're talking about, this kind of uh, world world view, and the way of constructing their society, how important is Buddhism to it? Yeah. So I think um, Zen Buddhism 
is extremely important to Japan at multiple levels. But Zen Buddhism is quite different to the Buddhism that we in India are familiar with. Um, it is Buddhism that traveled from India via uh, China, was mediated in China, uh, became what in China is called Chan Buddhism, and then continued a kind of eastward journey to over the Sea of Japan into the Japanese archipelago and became Zen Buddhism. And it was very foundational <clears throat> to a lot of Japanese philosophy, to its aesthetics, and to its way of thinking about itself. But Zen Buddhism is extremely esoteric. Um, and um, the problem with it is that uh, we can't really talk about it because we have to use words in order to talk about it. And all a lot about Zen is that words are deceptive and you know words kind of lead us down paths that do not uh, lead us to enlightenment or satori. So the whole idea is to somehow be able to disconnect yourself from words and to disconnect your yourself from rationality. It's a kind of irrational uh, sort of uh, practice uh, which makes it hard to talk about, to sort of really discuss in a forum like this, and it's, it's quite confusing. But I think the more you study it, and you saw, I did a lot of um, meditation, I did Zen meditation when, when I was there, and I sort of looked at a lot of the different those. Those are like based on the Chinese word Tao, like you, a lot of people know Tao Te Ching, um, and in Japanese, Tao, which is the path of the way, becomes Do. And so, for example, you have Chado, which is the way of the tea, tea ceremony. You have Kodo, um, uh, calligraphy, the way of writing, of handwriting. You have, oh, sorry, that's Shodo. Shodo is the way of handwriting. Kodo, you have Aikido, which is a kind of martial arts. You have busho, bush, Bushido, uh, you have swordsmanship. Kodo is swordsmanship, I think. And um, so on. So all of these ways are again very deeply influenced by the idea of Zen and the idea of constant repetition, repetition, repetition without any kind of ultimate goal and with possibly kind of trying to blur the distinctions between you as the subject and the object. So the idea that the sword and you just become one or your breath and you, you sort of really realize how it is one. And that, of course, also has a basis in traditional Hindu philosophy. Um, you know, if you look at the, the six traditional schools of Indian philosophy um, and how the idea is that there's Brahman out there and all of us have this unitary principle where we are all one with Brahman. And, and it's essentially about us being able to recognize that and uh, get rid of the duality of me and somebody else. Sorry, this is very philosophical. Um, I was a philosophy student in university, so I have a tendency to kind of go down these rabbit holes. Um, but, um, you know, so I think Zen has been fundamental to uh, many ways in which um, Japanese practice has developed. For example, the you know, when you go to a Japanese restaurant and you see the kind of care that's taken into um, the cooking of food and the fact that you will have people who are not allowed to actually slice fish, sushi chefs who are not allowed to slice fish for up to five or six years because they're just not considered good enough. And so that idea of repetition and repetition and the shokunin spirit, which is, you know, reaching towards a kind of perfection, I think that has a deep basis in Zen Buddhism. And you see that percolating into different aspects of Japanese culture, practice and society, including some of its business practices as well. So so in that sense, you could say Buddhism has been very fundamental to Japan. Um, but if you look at it in terms of is it, a, is it are they religious as a country? Not really. I mean, I think most uh, uh, surveys show that the vast majority of Japanese um, identify as atheists, even as um, they are also see themselves as Buddhists and Shinto, at least from the sort of ritualistic cultural point of view. So they're kind of more ritualistic and less theist. Fascinating. Um, there are a couple more questions I'd like to take from the audience, but let me ask you this question, which occurred to me. Uh, it's not, I didn't really see this bit in your book, but to what extent does his, history matter? This is a very uh, a country which, which, which maintains its historical uh, sites, but also is very futuristic in so many aspects of its uh, uh, building its cities and embrace the technology. To what extent is does the historical record matter? I know that, for instance, when the, the younger Chinese generations who I know, people who I know from China, they will bring up colonialism as though it happened quite recently. You know, it's a it is something that's in their minds. This uh, it's part of why they feel nationalistic. To what extent is when you were sitting and talking to people in Japan? To what extent did the history come back? Would or was the history? 
prevalent in the mind. Uh, say the defeat in World War II, or earlier the defeat of Russia, when they defeated Russia, the great Asian victory um, that took place. Is history omnipresent uh, uh, in in real ways in the thinking, or is it is it uh, is it more subtle than that? That's an interesting question. It's both present and not present. I think um, it's a complicated issue for most Japanese because they didn't come out as the good guys in the Second World War. And there's a great awareness of uh, the fact that they are seen as people who conducted a lot of atrocities. Um, of course, it's a huge political issue with both China and South Korea, which is ongoing and has not been resolved and continues to be something that holds Japan's ability to project its power in the region because it's not been able to settle these disputes with these countries. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, uh, it, it, it doesn't, ha- it's not a normal nation in that it is not allowed constitutionally to have its own uh, defense forces. And yeah. it has agreed to be under this specific umbrella of the US, um, essentially providing defense for it. So, you know, it, it can't really act like a normal country. And there's an awareness of that. And there's certainly a large number of people, particularly in politics who resent that, who think that, you know, history is written by the victor, what Japan did was nothing worse than what anybody else did, and that there's this great unfairness um, in uh, how Japan's hands were tied in terms of its autonomy as a nation post-Second World War. And I would count amongst those um, Shinzo Abe, the long-standing uh, right. PM who just resigned about six months ago, and his uh, party, the LDP, they're very hawkish, and a lot of what they have wanted to do is essentially constitutional reform to liberate Japan from those constraints so that it can now start to project its own power and not be as dependent on the US. However, they've not been able to do this, despite the fact that Shinzo Abe was in power for donkey's years, the longest serving prime minister in Japan, because frankly, it's very unpopular. Most Japanese are pacifists. They have internalized the necessity of being pacifists and this kind of fear of war, which is also, um, uh, I think the seed is there from Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki and the, the, uh, the atrocities that took place there, the result of the war into this kind of never again um, mode, which is why constitutional reform remains hugely unpopular and poll after poll, 60, 65% of the population are against the idea of Japan actually developing its own armed force All of that said, it's not a very political um, country in the sense that conversation, polite conversation does not tend to include politics. You're far more likely to hear people talking about the flowers and, you know, the blossoms are late this year or, you know, uh, oh, the cicadas are extremely loud. And, you know, there's sort of escape almost in a lot of talk in nature and um, in things of that. And I think Japan has kind of founded its identity very much on nature. It's quite interesting how that's given itself an identity that because of its own historical complexity, I think post-colonial nations have that kind of tended to base their modern identity on the colonial struggle. Japan could not do that because it was the colonizer. So kind of casting about for, you know, what is it that makes us us? And it's interesting, but this kind of sense that, oh, the four seasons are very unique here and this whole idea of nature and coordinating everything with the changing seasons, it's really big. You'll notice it. Like uh, everything becomes um, pink during spring. Everything becomes green during the summer. Everything is chest nutty during the autumn, you know, from uh, what you see in the stores to what people wear, and to a larger extent than in other countries. Of course, the seasons affect all countries, but I don't think that they play the same role in the self-narrative or self-understanding of the nation that they do in Japan. Um, So yeah, I mean, but then that said, you also have far-right demonstrators who are disproportionately loud. I mean, I would say the majority of Japanese are pacifists, but then you have these, like, uh, I think these people call the Oyoku Dankai, who are the ultra-nationalist right wing. They tend to be octogenarians and they're hilarious on one level in that they have these jeeps which are kind of like souped up versions of Mad Max convoys um, and they blast military imperial music and they fly the imperial Japanese flag and they're normally silver haired and sort of screaming all kinds of invective as they uh, you know zoom through the streets of Tokyo it's always on Sunday because they get permission to do this on Sunday and I was at the receiving end of this disproportionately because I lived between the South Korean and the Chinese embassies (laughs) so you know I was um, I had them sort of constantly go by every Sunday Um, And it's interesting because for a 
a country that is so invested in oral silence and oral, by oral, I mean this oral, auditory silence and uh, auditory peace, uh, uh, to have these people who are so loud screaming, and this happens almost every Sunday, and it's completely tolerated by society. And when I would bring it up to Japanese friends, they were very, they would just kind of look um, as though embarrassed, slightly embarrassed, but something that they didn't want to talk about. They were almost invisible. They were right there in front of you. They were in uh, unavoidable presence, but it's almost like they had become invisible. People would just walk past them without you know, acknowledging what was going on, even though what was going on was very theatrical and really quite over the top cra and, and, and crazy. So you, you, you definitely do have this militaristic, unreconstructed uh, imperialist strand um, in Japan. And what's worrying is that it's, it's overly represented in the political order. Luckily, the I don't think it's represented in the general population. So you have a disjunction, therefore, between the political order and what people really want. Um, so it's something to watch going forward. That's super fascinating. Thank you for that, um, Balavi. Um, so there's another question which actually ties into what you were just talking about. It's from Tanuja Sachdev, and she's asking about patriarchy and gender relations. So this, this actually ties back to what you were talking about just now, about a certain strand of uh, thinking being overrepresented in politics. Because if you look at the demographics, Japan is, Japan, Japanese women live much longer than, uh, than Japanese men. I think they're now overrepresented in the workplace, um, you know, more than 50% or something like that. Or maybe, maybe that, maybe that data point is wrong, but, but it's, uh, can you, can you comment a little bit about how how in the terms of gender relations, how does this play out? Um, the, in, in you know, super interesting, uh, uh, Vivek, and it's something I'm asked about often, gender in Japan, because I think that in the global imagination, um, Japanese women are a sort of beleaguered lot. And the idea is that Japan is a deeply patriarchal society. And despite uh, all the progress that it might have made on in many ways, I think the, it's kind of Achilles heel remains um, gender empowerment and it remains a deeply traditional gender divided society. So there is some truth to this. And when you look at, for example, the world economic economic forum gender rankings, Japan is consistently um, way below any of any other OECD country. So it might be ahead of some developing countries, but it is uh, certainly an outlier when it comes to economically developed countries in terms of political representation of women. I think there's only one or two women in the entire cabinet um, uh, of first um, uh, Shinzo Abe, now uh, Yoshida Suga, and um, they are underrepresented at, at the upper level of or upper echelons of business, certainly, um, and science and, you know, uh, many, 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 many fields. However, I think when Indians ask me this question about, oh, poor Japanese women, I tend to get a bit irritated because there's no comparison between the Indian woman's status and the Japanese woman's status. To begin with, if you're just looking at labor force, 77% uh, of Japanese women work which is higher than the global average. And the, uh, the, 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 the concomitant figure for India, I think is 29% or 27% and dropping as we speak. I mean, the number of women um, in the workforce in India is declining rather than going up. One of those great mysteries um, that more needs to be written about. Uh, so Japan has a lot of women who are working and are certainly not sitting at home deprived of any rights. The problem is that they tend not to be able to uh, climb up the ladder, that there is definitely a glass ceiling and that a, a large number of women are trapped in menial jobs or middle ranking jobs and they cannot kind of reach the top. What is the reason for this? Um, uh, I think essentially the, I would lay the blame on the Japanese culture of work. And I think the Japanese culture, work culture, and I think Japanese work culture penalizes both men and women in different ways, but in terrible ways uh, and to the detriment of its society. Um, and it's essentially a work culture that needs, that does not allow any kind of private life. It does not acknowledge any private life and it does not allow for the employee to have an alternative role, be that as carer or parent. So the way that the work culture is set up means that if you want to have children, one person will have to be at home, one person will be at work because the person 
person who is at work will often be working eight, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, will often miss the last train home back home and have to sleep in dormitories that are provided in most Japanese workplaces because so many people end up sleeping there overnight instead of going home, will often have to work weekends, will not be allowed to take any time off during the year, including the 10 days of mandatory leave. They only get 10 days of mandatory leave in the year. And most Japanese people I know do not take them off. Uh, um, so, you know, the, the whole work culture is set up on such an idea of overinvestment in the office that it makes it extremely hard um, to have any kind of other life, which, which is why I think you see a lot of these uh, traditional um, uh, family uh, uh, family architecture with women staying at home while men work. Um, but to be honest, if you were to pose the question in another way and ask me, would you rather be a Japanese man or a Japanese woman? And I answer that question in the book uh, as well. I plump for being a Japanese woman. I think it's far better being at home and having your children and reading good novels and going out for lunch and you know having a life than having to go at uh, six in the morning on a two hour commute, work all day long, essentially suck up to your bosses, go out at the night drinking uh, until um, you, know, you basically pass out and then press that on repeat. And we see a huge number of people that essentially die in offices as a result and Japan is one of the only countries in the world that has a word karoshi which means death by overwork and every year you have hundreds and hundreds of uh, people who are okay, of deaths that are investigated for being suspected cases of karoshi where either the person just drops dead on their desk or they end up dying of heart attacks or hypertension but when you look at their medical or their or their or their work record you realize that they have been doing you know 110 hours of work a week for the last three months before they drop dead. Um, so, you know, I, 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 there's a huge problem with the Japanese uh, work culture. And frankly, people, uh, it doesn't make them more productive either. I think time and time again, it's shown that there's actually, um, uh, th 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 there's the mal effects to, to this kind of uh, work culture and they would do much better to work smarter, work shorter hours. And I think that will automatically lead to greater gender balance balance um, in the workplace. Thank you for that. Um, we, I'd like to, uh, there are a couple more questions I have, and we must talk about uh, this wonderful character of the Indian politician in Japan, who you spent some time with. Oh, I guess, Yogi, 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 Yogi. But uh, there are some good questions. Um, so let's take a couple. Uh, one, one thing we haven't talked about is uh, Japan's immense soft power. I know that many, many Indians also, uh, including my sons, are very obsessed with uh, Japanese uh, animation, with Japanese uh, uh, manga, with uh, with a lot of other things like that. And Sanjoy Hazarika has asked, can you talk a little bit about trends in Japanese fiction, please? Would like to I think you see a, a lot of uh, a lot of murder mysteries. Um, it's become very popular. You had this kind of phase where. Um, Nordic um, um, murder mysteries and uh, detectives and all were quite popular. And we're seeing a huge amount of uh, sort of crime fiction um, coming out of Japan. Then there's always been the sort of surreal, uh, uh, because you know, Haru, uh, Murakami, of course, uh, being the leading exponent. And we still see a lot of um, sort of work that is slightly off kilter. Um, you know, it reads possibly like a normal narrative, but when you look, look below the surface, there's something that's kind of completely wrong. And I think that a lot of Japanese people feel that about Japan as well, that it can on the surface look like all is calm and all is well. But when you are suppressing and oppressing so many things, there are things that are going on in the subterranean world of both the psyche and literally in the subterranean world in Japan, looking at the Yakuza and things like that as well. So I think we see a lot of literature like that. I'm just sort of leaning over here to look at my bookshelf uh, for some help. Um, um, uh, we had an excellent book called Pachinko out, I think, a couple of years ago, which was about the Zainichi. It was about the ethnic uh, Koreans um, in uh, Japan. 
and the discrimination that they have faced. What's very fascinating is because they were not really allowed to enter the workplace uh, for normal jobs, most of them either ended up joining the mafia, the Yakuza, which is an equal opportunities employer, or they went into the pachinko business, which is the it's a kind of gray underworld. It's partly legal, but there's a lot of illegal stuff that goes on in there as well. These kind of slot machine bars where, uh, which are a kind of national addiction in Japan. So we're seeing interesting uh, work. I, you know, I think the grotesque and the surreal still tends to uh, hold uh, a center court um, uh, in a lot of Japanese literature. But I, I'm quite interested in some of the crime fiction that's coming out. I think there's this Keigo, what's his name? Here we are. Uh, Keigo Higashi, you know, he's become hugely popular and there's tons of his books now. And he's referred to as the Japanese Stig Larsen by the Times. Um, so yeah, lots of interesting uh, modern contemporary work. Um, and I think um, just as uh, Vivek was saying earlier about Japanese soft power uh, being uh, a force to contend with, I think I would include um, Japanese literature in that. Japan is endlessly fascinating for a lot of people. And I think it wields a disproportionate amount of soft power. We've talked about how it doesn't have its own military so that its ability to project strategic hard power is circumscribed. As an economic power, it is also sort of stagnant. For the last 20 or 30 years, we haven't seen it take off. It is um, challenged by bigger rivals like China and even South Korea has done a much better job. But I think when it comes to the, the realm of culture, Japan is a superpower and whether we see it in terms of manga and anime, whether we see it in terms of Japanese food, which has just become huge. I'm in Madrid at the moment and, you know, this was quite a provincial city 10 years ago. You had good Spanish food, but not that much else. I think we'll now see more Japanese slash Japanese Peruvian uh, fusion uh, restaurants than you almost do the old traditional uh, Madrileno bar. So we're seeing, um, I think, uh, the, I think Japan uh, has a huge um, a reservoir of attraction uh, uh, and soft power, whether it's literature, whether it is um, some of its um, movie, um, it's, it's sort of uh, filmmakers, um, and then of course it's technology as, as well. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it is unbelievably powerful. I know that, you know, people like Hayao Miyazaki and have just been like globally massively significant and uh, there are whole schools of people all over the world who follow them. Um, let's let's talk about yogi. Um, so this, what, what about what was what, what was it like being an Indian in Japan? So we know the Japanese have a horror about you know smells and tastes and sometimes even a cold fear of the foreigner. What was it like being an Indian in Japan for you in general? And also, please tell us about this remarkable character who's managed to become a, a an elected official in Japan who was uh, grew up in India. Yeah, so you know, um, Vivek, I would not extrapolate from my experience to any kind of general experience because I was in a hugely privileged position. It's something that I'm very aware of and I try to foreground in the book because I don't want to claim otherwise. Um, so, you know, I was there, as, I mean, I was as, uh, in a diplomatic posting. I was living in one of the poshest areas of uh, Tokyo and, you know, given my sort of elite background and all of that, I don't think that my experience of being a foreigner would be the experience of a lot of other foreigners simply because I would be given a certain amount of leeway um, and uh, uh, you know there would be a sort of distance I would I would be forgiven many things that I think um, some uh, a, a less um, uh, what's the word privileged a less privileged uh, uh, foreign foreigner might experience so I think the majority of the Indian community in Japan uh, it's not huge it's possible 3,000, 4,000 people. Um, and, uh, but it has grown. About 20 years ago, we were looking at 300 or 400 people. And a lot of them began to come into the country and into Tokyo specifically um, during 2000, when you had the Y2K scare and the idea that there was 
going to be everything going wrong with computer systems around the world at the turn of the millennium. And many companies hired Indian engineers to come and um, take a look at this. Um, uh, in, and then many of them stayed on. They ended up having jobs, stayed on. And we ended up having a small area in the eastern part of Tokyo called Irogawa, which has emerged as somewhat of an India town. Um, you know, it's very modest. Um, it probably boasts about three spice stores, maybe six or seven Indian restaurants. It does have two Indian schools, uh, which teach the CBSC curriculum. Um, and one thing I discovered was that there are some Japanese children who attend these schools primarily to learn math. Indian math has a huge reputation in Japan for some reason. Every time I met people, they would say, oh, India math, very good. And, you know, I didn't tell them about my, how much I failed my math. What a exam, mistake. Right? What Middle a mistake. school. <laughs> He <laughs> kept very quiet about that. But yeah, so because math has this um, has this reputation, you, you do even find some Japanese children who will attend, uh, at least in the early years, the, um, the Indian, Indian schools in Irogawa. And um, from all the people that I spoke to, um, the Japanese kept a distance. There was difficulty in integrating at many levels. To begin with, they found it difficult to get housing. Um, there was uh, there is serious housing discrimination in Japan against foreigners, and this is not only limited to Indians. You see it with the Chinese, with the uh, Koreans, with people from Southeast Asia, Nepali, and so on. That landlords will not lease to uh, foreigners, and they are very onerous conditions in terms of deposits, what they call key money, and um, and so on. You also have to have a Japanese person vouch for you, and um, you know it's not easy for immigrants in Japan at all, uh, even for those that have been sponsored by companies and are there com in a completely legitimate uh, way. Um, they would, they were, there were people who would say to me that there's this thing called the infamous Gaijin seat. Gaijin means foreigner, outsider. And the infamous Gaijin seat is when you're sitting on a, in the metro and nobody will sit next to you and they would rather stand up rather than sit next to you. And this is something I heard from a lot of um, the Indians uh, I spoke to in Irogawa. Um, there is a sense that they just do not know how to operate within Japanese society and they fixate on very strange things. One of them, of course, is talking. One of them is eating while walking. There's this huge uh, um, uh, sense that we should not walk and eat. So like the American idea of grabbing a sandwich which and eating it while uh, you know en route to office does not wash uh, in Japan, and there's a lot of anxiety around that. And I remember that the newspapers would be full of articles about tourist season in Kyoto and how tourists were going to come and eat ice cream and then walk around the streets eating ice cream and possibly dripping it on the pavement. And how do we convince them not to do this? And they were actually publishing manner manners guides and you know politely handing them out to um, customers at the ice cream shops. Generates a lot of anxiety, almost like a moral panic and then there was the garbage sorting rules which are a real labyrinth but they're taken extremely seriously for recycling purposes and it, and most Japanese think that non-Japanese cannot deal with garbage recycling rules which is why some landlords told me they were unwilling to rent to foreigners Indians included because they wouldn't be able to deal with the garbage recycling which I thought was really very random until I met Yogi Puranik uh, who was born in Ambadnath um, in Maharashtra and moved Moved to Japan in 2000 to, for a job with IBM, I think, initially. And he has now become, about two or three years ago, the first ever elected local uh, municipal councilman. Uh, what's interesting about him is that everybody who voted for him, there were about 6,000 people who voted for him in the ward, were Japanese because if you are not uh, a, a citizen, you cannot vote. So although he was voted in in an area where a lot of Indians live, it's not as though the Indians are voting for him. It's the Japanese who are voting for him. But they were voting for him because they realized that there are a lot of Indians living here. And so they wanted somebody to be a kind of bridge between their concerns and the Indian community who is resident over there. And Yogi told me that one of the things that he stood on was to try to, uh, one of the platforms he stood on was to try to get uh, proper education for foreigners 
i.e. Indians in this case, for garbage uh, recycling rules, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> that was his number one <laughs> item on his agenda. Uh, but, you know, he thought it was very important. But yeah, you know, his is a fascinating example. He told me that all his life he has fought to be accepted uh, by Japanese society. He used to volunteer um, for the local community fair. They have like a community fair that they held every year. It was a big deal that he was allowed in because he was a foreigner and then at some point somebody suggested he also join the managing committee there was a hoo-ha of how can we have a foreigner on the managing committee because then they will know all the fights we have and you know we can't let them know the kind of dirty we can't like air our dirty laundry in front of foreigners anyway he eventually made it on that uh, managing committee board and and then the next step was um standing for elections he 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 plans to kind of keep going so we'll, it'll be interesting to see uh his path and how far a foreigner can really make it. But it's a small sign of change. And it's one small sign of change amongst many that for uh, for various reasons and perhaps kicking and screaming, but Japan is opening up because it's, it doesn't really have that much of a choice given its demographic uh, makeup and um, sort of, you know, the globalization forces in the world today. So we are seeing a reluctant Japan slowly opening and uh, I think the, the story of Yogi Puranik is one example of that. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been it's been an hour. So back to, yes. I loved all of that. There's so much more we can talk about. There's also, I didn't realize the Miss Japan was uh, a few years ago was half Indian, which is really awesome. Half so Indian. I remember the one yes. who was African American, I think. But, uh, yes. but that's quite interesting. Um, uh, and uh, highly recommend the book. But back to you, I guess, Preeti. Thank you. Thank you. That's been really lovely going over everything and uh, listening to you, uh, adding on to what, of course, I've been reading also in the book. So lovely. There was one question about, you know, that Battle of Imphal and all that. I remember seeing a little bit of it in one of those shrines there in Tokyo. Yashaguni or something Yasakuni, yeah, yeah. Was it there? I, mean, I haven't seen anything about the Battle of Imphal, but there's Judge Pal. There's, uh, there's a judge uh, who is quite venerated in Japan, who was part of the military commission post the Second World War to oh, adjudicate yeah. about who would become class A war criminals and who would not. And the Indian judge on this panel was the only one who basically said this uh, thing that, you know, this uh, history is written by the victors. And frankly, why should there be a class A, uh, a criminal category that's invented purely for Japanese uh, when people have, you know, committed huge amounts of atrocities on all sides of the border. So he was not against the idea of them being punished, but he was against the idea of this special category that somehow made the Japanese uniquely villainous mm. and um, and so he was the only person in that military tribunal who wrote a dissenting opinion and as a result he's quite a the darling of the right in, in Japan as you can imagine and they keep making television serials about him every 10 years and there's lots of books written about him so yeah he's somebody who's not known that well in India but uh, he kind of is um, a well-known figure in Japan. Thank you and thank you Vivek for bringing all of this out.